Thank you very much, David, and and thank you very much to the organizers to uh, invite UNESCO at this eighth edition of the uh, Open Science Conference. We are very happy to be here and very happy to be part of this uh, evolution of open science, as Klaus was just mentioning. I think it's really interesting to see how the movement was born and how it has grown and how not only uh, it has grown among scientists, different disciplines, but also around the world. And more and more stakeholders or actors are now actively engaging in, in open and I think what is important from our point of view, from the UNESCO's point of view, so UNESCO is the UN agency in charge of education, science, culture, and, and communication, is really to see it as um, a global movement that benefits everybody equally. So I think one of the reasons why um, UNESCO is now particularly involved in, in looking for this global consensus on open science is to ensure that open science in the future and now uh, helps to um, narrow the digital gap between countries and the science technology innovation gaps, and that it doesn't actually widen them even more. So we really do have to think about that when we think about open science practices and how it affects different countries around the world. Um, so I'm going to start my presentation now. Um, as I said, we've we've and we've heard also from the opening uh, talk from, from Klaus, I mean, the need for science technology innovation is, is really everywhere. And with this current pandemics, it, it has been really put at the forefront and very visible for everybody how important it is to have access to timely uh, information, to scientific data, to publications, to, to rigorous information that can be uh, scrutinized, that can be used by, by, different, um, by different scientists and also by different actors. We've also seen that it, scientific collaborations around the world are critical because uh, we do have some advancements in certain parts of the world. If we manage to have a scientific collaboration, it just goes faster, it's more efficient, we can do so much more in, in, in a shorter amount of time. And again, with these pandemics, I think we have shown how much we can achieve very quickly, but we have also shown that we can go even further than that. And that, you know, opening science should be something that goes beyond pandemics and crisis situations. The third thing is also that we've seen that really there is this huge importance of having a, a good, healthy, science policy society dialogue. It builds trust in science, both at the level of citizens, as well as the, at, uh, at the level of policy makers and decision makers. So it is critical to have this science communication and, um, and, and, and trust uh, in science. And of course, with opening science, there is also a, a big responsibility of explaining uh, scientific data and information to a broader audience. As we move faster, let's say, in um, revealing some of the results, we also have to have this, uh, uh, this, this effort of explaining at which stage we are uh, with the results, what are the, uh, what are the, um, uh, what are the, the advantages and possible disadvantages of opening up data relatively quickly uh, and, and relatively uh, um, early on in the, in, in the, in the, in the science process. Um, and, and, and that's why open science, again, is, is, is really important. It is an important movement that, that, that for us, from the UNESCO perspective, it is a movement that is trying to transform scientific process, uh, make it more democratic, more transparent, more um, tangible also, not just to scientists themselves, but also to the society uh, in a broader sense. It allows for the scientific information to be more widely accessible, to be more reliably harnessed, and it allows this more active engagement of all the other stakeholders. But as I said, from our perspective, what is really important is that it is, um, open science has the potential of really bridge, bridging the science technology and uh, innovation gaps, and also fulfilling the human right to science. And also in the world of the United Nations and in the world of, of you know, sustainable development across borders, open science is increasingly seen as a critical accelerator 
for the achievement of sustainable development goals, the famous SDGs. Um, the problem that we have been facing lately is that, as Klaus was saying, uh, there is a proliferation right now of policy instruments, of uh, strategies, of different practices, and, and we see a little bit of a fragmentation both in scientific and policy environment with the lack of a true global understanding of what open science is, what it means, what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, and what are the possible risks of open science. So that is why um, at the UNESCO General Conference uh, last year, the member states of UNESCO, we have 193 member states, they agreed and gave um, the organization the task of developing an international standard setting instrument on open science, which is this UNESCO um, recommendation on open science. And the idea was really to lead a very comprehensive, consultative and inclusive process in developing this global uh, recommendation. So just to, 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 to make it a little bit more clear uh, as to what the UNESCO recommendation is. So it is a legal instrument um, in which the General Conference, so which is the, the, the governing body of, of UNESCO, formulates principles and norms for the international regulation of a particular question. And it invites member states to take whatever legal and uh, legislative or other steps to actually apply those principles and norms uh, in their respective territories. So even if it's not a legally binding instrument, as for example, a convention, it is a legal instrument that is monitored across the, uh, in, in time and member states are supposed to report back as to what is the, 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 the rate of implementation of the different provisions in the recommendation. So it really is an instrument that is designed to influence um, legislation, national laws and practices in, in different uh, member states. So what did we do in the past uh, year, year and a half? So since uh, uh, November uh, uh, 2019, we really uh, in, in UNESCO tried to have as, as broad consultative process as possible uh, to develop this, this global recommendation, the different uh, definitions, the different actions that need to be taken by member states and other stakeholders. And we've had a number of different consultations. We had a global consultation, which was like a survey online. And I am sure that many people who are actually today with us have contributed to that um, global survey. Uh, we got some 3,000 inputs from 133 countries and really across the different uh, stakeholder groups and across different institutions. We did the regional multi-stakeholder consultations in all the different regions of the world. So in Africa, Europe and North America, Arab states, Asia and Pacific, Latin America, Caribbean and Eastern Europe trying to get a feeling for what are the differences and where are the synergies in the understanding and the practice of open science across, across the world. And we had a series of thematic uh, and stakeholder consultations with young scientists in particular, citizen science, academies, science unions, libraries, uh, open access platforms, data organizations, the rest of the UN system, and indigenous peoples, amongst others. So we really, really try to have as much consultations as possible. In the beginning, we I have to say we were a little bit afraid because of the pandemic, we were not able to have face-to-face -face consultations. But actually, it turned out that this, you know, digital environment was actually a pretty good way of gathering even more people together and having even more people participate in these conversations. So um, we do hope to gather everybody in one place at a certain point because it is important to talk to each other uh, also uh, physically. But I do have to say that in the end, uh, the, the virtual environment was very, very, very conducive to this broad uh, consultation that we that we've had. Uh, so the next thing that happened is that based on all these different um, um, uh, inputs that we've received, uh, we, our director general appointed an open science advisory committee. Uh, it's around 30 experts from different parts of the world who helped the secretariat kind of gather all the different inputs and put it in the first draft of the recommendation. 
this first draft of the recommend recommendation was sent to all the member states at the end of September last year. And it was also posted online for comments from different partners and stakeholders. Um, now we are at the stage where we are actually incorporating all those comments back into the draft and we are going to release the second draft of, of the recommendation at the, sometimes in March uh, and by the end of March um, at the and we actually today have a meeting of the advisory committee where we will go through some of these comments and see how we have to reflect them in the final draft. So what I, what I would like to do now very briefly is just to go very quickly through what we have in the, um, uh, in, in the first draft now. And as I said, things will change because we did receive very constructive comments both from member states and from the different uh, stakeholders. In general, I would say the, the comments were pretty positive. And I think because of this broad consultation that we had, we did manage to capture a lot of voices and, um, uh, and, 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 and show the complexity and the breadth of open science. It really is a very complex system that has all of the different um, parts and each and every part has its own structures and its own governance systems. And we kind of will have to put it all together if we do want open science to really be the new normal for, for the future. So uh, the, the recommendation, of course, has a preamble, aims and objectives, definition. Uh, we define some core values and guiding principles and then areas of action and monitoring um, that will have to be put in place. Uh, of course, the aim of the recommendation is to provide an international framework for open science policy and practice that recognizes the regional differences in open science perspectives and takes account takes into account the specific challenges of scientists in and other actors in different countries and in particular in developing countries and that it really contributes to the digital technological and um, to reducing the digital technological and knowledge divide between and within countries i have to say that uh, from the South in particular, uh, there is a lot of interest in open science, but there is also a lot of caution. And they, uh, I, I think opening up um, data, opening up access to scientific information, to research, to publications, etc., it really needs to be done in an equitable way that everybody can benefit from. And I think this is the key message coming from the South, uh, saying, we really have to be careful that those who have um, bigger and more important technological um, advancements do not take advantage of the others who don't. So we, that, that, I think, at the global level is going to be um, something to really take into account as we develop open science um, globally. Um, in terms of the definition, I think uh, the definition will stay more or less, uh, more or less uh, the, the same. And it really is this broad idea of uh, open science as making scientific knowledge methods and data available, but also increase scientific collaboration, sharing of information, and uh, engaging the, the, the broader society together uh, with the in, um, uh, more traditional scientific community. With this idea of the scientific outputs, uh, which should be as open as possible and as closed as necessary, of course, taking into consideration privacy and security issues um, that I am sure you will be talking about also during this, this conference. Um, in terms of uh, core values and guiding principles, of course, it's quality, integrity, inclusiveness and diversity, collective benefit, the idea of you know science as a common good. Um, and, and open science as enabler and driver of, uh, of developing scientific practice in this, in this aspect of science as science, as a, as a, global, as a global good. Uh, we've tried also to define some elements of open science. This will probably change a little bit in the next, uh, in the next draft. Um, of course, with open data, open access, open source uh, so, uh, softwares, open evaluations, open science infrastructures, educational resources, and also this openness to engagement with societal actors and to uh, the diversity of knowledge, including building a dialogue with, uh, uh, with indigenous knowledge systems and other scholarly systems. All the way, 
while still, of course, maintaining and increasing the quality of the scientific research and scientific um, just briefly, in terms of actions, I think uh, there is a broad agreement on the areas for action. It is to promote a common understanding of open science, develop an enabling policy environment, investment in open science infrastructures and services in a broader sense, so not just digital infrastructures, but also other infrastructures, investment in capacity building for open science, transforming scientific culture, because it's not going to be easy to switch to open science in some of the assessment processes and evaluation processes do not follow, uh, promote innovative approaches for open science at different stages of the scientific process, and of course, promoting international uh, collaboration. So just very quickly as to the next, um, as to the next steps, we, uh, as I said, are now collecting these different um, comments from member states and other actors. And the idea is uh, to um, incorporate them into the second draft, which will be shared with member states uh, and everybody else by the end of March at the latest. Um, the member states will then start their negotiations, right? The member states actually have to negotiate this text and they have to agree on it in the end. We will have these intergovernmental meetings in May and in July if necessary, and then the document goes to the general conference, possibly, hopefully, for a November um, this year. So this is a little bit where we are with the process. Um, we are very, very, very grateful for all the contributions we've had from different actors, including a, a lot of the audience of, of the conference. And I'd be very happy to respond to some um, additional questions as well from the audience now. So that would be that would be all from my side from for the moment. I hope I didn't go too much over time, uh, and I'm happy to respond to the questions as well. Super. Thank you very much, Anna. First of all, fantastic presentation. I hope everyone could hear and see it well around the world. I'm going to first take a look into our questions box, and again, I want to remind everyone they can go ahead and and enter their questions, so we can talk directly to our speakers. Let me see here. I have uh, the first question here from Yo Habermann, and I'm go ahead and I'm going to read it to you. Big thanks to UNESCO for actively and explicitly consulting with indigenous peoples for the hashtag open science in your globally inclusive approach. What were the learnings in incorporating indigenous knowledge into the recommendations? Anna, and thank you for the question, Joe. Yeah, great, uh, great question. We really did try to um, have this conversation with indigenous peoples to understand what their position is with regards to open science. Uh, and, and I think we had a, a, a pretty big consultation in January this year on the draft text of the recommendation. And I think, uh, again, even there, we, there was a lot of caution from indigenous they were very happy to see that the scientific process is opening up and that there is this openness towards dialogue with indigenous uh, knowledge holders in particular. But they were very cautious in terms of how this dialogue should, um, sh sh should evolve and what does it mean to share data, to share knowledge, to share information. So um, indigenous peoples, as you know, have already been very much involved with regards to the indigenous data governance uh, systems, uh, with the care principles that they have uh, developed as a response to the fair principles of open science. So the feeling is that they are ready to engage. However, it cannot just be, you know, openly going and accessing information without certain agreements being put in place, without certain rules being put in place as to how the information is to be shared. And also, I think from the um, indigenous people's perspective, uh, the indigenous knowledge systems are specific ways and epistemologies or epistemologies of producing knowledge, right? So what they do not want to see is that their knowledge is taken and then validated and revalidated and used in, 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 in different ways, which is not necessarily in line of how they perceive knowledge and how they transmit knowledge, etc. So there has to be a huge respect between the two communities once they start sharing data and, and, and engaging. Of course, we're not starting from scratch. Uh, there is more and more um, good uh, 
practices in in this sense that are coming out and as science is opening there will hopefully be more and more of, of practices like this but as i said uh, a lot of enthusiasm and at the same time a lot of caution as to how these things happen so that we avoid any type of you know misuse and exploitation of data coming from indigenous knowledge holders super thank you very much we have a, a few questions coming in uh fantastic let me go to the next one here it has already seven votes and the question is what role does science communication play in your concept so um Science communication was probably something that we were a little bit left out in the first draft, and then the member states and other uh, actors just called us on that. Uh, and I think uh, it will come up much more strongly in the second draft. Science communication obviously is a huge part, uh, incredibly important for open science. And when I talk about science communication, of course, it is the scientific communication as uh, the traditional uh, way of communicating science, and then communicating science to different audiences, to broader audiences. So people uh, like David, journalists, science journalists in particular, also have a huge role to play into translating this scientific information that will be more and more available um, to the general public. Also to, to kind of counteract the possibility of misinformation or false information that can also be um, more and more available now uh, um, in the context of, or, of open science as well. So, um, as I said, science communication is going to be something very important for the future. Absolutely true. And it is a challenge, especially when you have such complicated you know, theories and things that you're trying to explain to the everyday person that doesn't have the luxury of dealing with these, these complex issues 10 hours every day. So that's a big challenge for everyone, including journalists. Absolutely correct, Anna. Uh, great with the questions. Fantastic. We have a few more coming through here. Um, we have from Axel Kohler. What are the specific worries of the global South concerning open science strategies? One might think that it is very much in their interest to have as much open practice as possible since they are encountering various constraints on access. Yes, I, one can always see, see it from both sides, right? Uh, on one hand, it is true that they will have more access. There is more access to, uh, uh, to the information which is produced in the north. But don't forget that the infrastructures are not necessarily yet in place. The technology in the south is not necessarily yet in place. And what they are really afraid of is if we do not have shared infrastructure and sh shared technologies also which would allow them to access that information, that then they will be lagging behind even more, and that, that basically they will be opening up their data and not necessarily be able at the same time to access data uh, from uh, from the north. So it really, it, it's a question of equity. It's a question of just, even when we were talking about this global open science cloud, it's a very good idea, but we do have to take into account the fact that you know, infrastructures, just basic connectivity is not necessarily in place in all parts of the world in the same way. So there are some things that one still has to think about while putting in place some of these global uh, global structures. But as I said, enthusiasm is there. It's just a little bit of caution also because I think there is a history there as well huh, where there was a lot of uh, um, exploitation of data um, from the south, and I think the, the the scientists are now saying, let's let's do this more equitably and let's do this rightly and, and justly this time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I have a few more questions here. I'll try to get to them. The next one: What precondition for being open is having a sustainable open license? There are established open definitions. For example, open source, open data, Creative Commons. What are the license recommendations of UNESCO? So I, the, the recommendation as it stands now is pretty broad because you have to understand also that it's, it's an international um, standard setting instrument. So we are trying to accommodate as much as possible views from different parts of the world and from different stakeholders. Uh, as I said, we will be talking uh, in the coming days a little bit more on some of these more concrete and specific recommendations. But I think the idea is to be as open as possible to the diversity of different tools that one can use to, tra to, to, to um, transition to open science. Uh, our, our problem is that if we are too pres prescriptive, 
it may be seen by certain countries or by certain actors as as too narrow and this idea maybe of you know one um, one solution fits all is is not going to work uh, either so we are trying to look across the spectrum of different um, um, instruments including in terms of, of, of licensing and, and 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 try to be as inclusive and as, as possible with regards to the licenses that, 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 that can be used and that can promote uh, open science more broadly super I'm looking at the clock we have time for about two more questions and maybe to the ZBW organizers we should take into effect I know this is our first time doing this online but we really have some fantastic questions coming our way so we will certainly make note of those questions, uh, but in addition, maybe for later this afternoon or tomorrow, we can add a few more minutes for the Q&A sessions, because I see here really fantastic questions coming our way. But okay, we have time for two more questions. Let me continue. Um, the next one would be, what do you perceive as the main barriers to implementing open science and changing science culture across the globe? Why would scientific communities not want to take on an open science approach? Yeah. Um, Benjamin, sorry, Benjamin Stewart. Yes, thank you for that. Um, again, what was interesting in the consultations that we've had is that um, depending on the kind of the, 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 the population you're talking to, not just in different parts of the world, but also like young scientists versus those who are a little bit adva more advanced in their careers, depending on the different disciplines, de depending on, you know, there, there are so many different uh, again, parts of science that then has to fit in, in, in open science and not necessarily we have a, a, a very, uh, the same view of what open science is and what it means and how it should be put together from these different communities. Uh, young scientists, for example, and I'll take that their example because I find it very, very important, particularly if, you know, we're looking into the future here. So we, we do depend on what the, the reactions of young scientists will be. They're very keen to share. And I think it's kind of in their DNA, in their culture, they're used to sharing much more than maybe some uh, more experienced uh, um, uh, scientists. However, for the moment, the evaluation criteria for the assessment of their careers, of how they progress, of how, you know, how, uh, how they're valued within their scientific community is not necessarily always in line with open science uh, principles. So some of these things really need to change so that they have more incentives to basically open up and have more and more open access, open, uh, open science practices. Um, it, it will depend, of course, on the grants that are, that are uh, provided, the funders, how are they going to also uh, integrate open science practices in the, in the grants, but also really in the evaluation of the, uh, 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 of the scientific careers of, of scientists. Uh, if that gets more open and more prone to openness, then certainly um, that barrier will be lifted, uh, lifted as well. And I think in general, there is still a huge effort of advocating and explaining what open science is that needs to be held around the world. There is a certain community which now is very comfortable with open science com concepts and practices, etc., but it's still a very small fraction of the entire scientific community. So, you know, ed ed education will, will play a huge role in explaining what it is for those who are possibly afraid of it or who do not know how to engage. We will have to do a huge effort globally to advocate for open science and to explain what it is and how, it's, how it can be done. What are the different approaches to open science? Yeah. And I had a question. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've had the boom of social media do you think social media is a positive thing as far as getting information out to people with open science or we have to be cautious about it because as we know it can also be abused well that's that's kind of the the you you always have this uh, positive and negative sides and now i think with the pandemics we know what the challenges are we know what the risks are so if we put a little bit more effort to address those challenges and those risks then we can use social media even better uh, for disseminating scientific knowledge and communicating about uh, about science. So we are learning. I think really it's a learning process. Uh, and again, this, this pandemic has just pushed us all to, 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 to have a lot of these issues really in, in front of us. And, 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 
And there's a lot to learn from there and, and approaches to put in place strategies and policies and actions uh, to mitigate the risks as much as possible and then um, use the benefits as much as possible at the same time. Super, Anna. Real quick, we call this a lightning round. I have two final questions. I know we have a few more. We couldn't get to all of them. I'd ask you in two or three sentences to answer these next two questions. The first one from Sibylla Soaring, which sort or system, excuse me, which sort or system of incentives are you discussing or aiming at? First one, real briefly. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it's a big question though. Uh, yeah. As <laughs> brief as you can. Yeah, no, it, it, it really is kind of alignment of different incentives coming from different sources, uh, whether it's funders, whether it's uh, ac ac academia and evaluation systems, as I said. Uh, these are kind of the, I, th I would say, the, 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 the two biggest incentives that we've been talking about uh, in the recommendation for the moment. Okay, super. And I've just been giving the, the thumbs up. We have to conclude the session. I, I want to say, first of all, thank you, Anna. Could we give a round of applause, everyone from around the world where we're watching? Thank you. This is, uh, it's always exciting to have the first speaker there. And uh, I can see already we have a lot of participation, a lot of questions. Thank you for helping us kick off our Open Science Conference. Please stick around as long as you can. I know you have a meeting coming up in about a half an hour, but stick around as long as you can for our next presentation. Thank you, Anna. Okay.